Folks, welcome into a brand new episode of Trainwreck Fantasy Sports Week 3 Fantasy Fallout. And what a week it was from a Bills perspective, from a fantasy perspective. So much to talk about. We got some guy Steve here and Sneaky Joe DiBiase from WGR 550. We're going to waste no time, going to get right into it. And I think one of the biggest storylines from this weekend, from at least for me, is the Kansas City Chiefs. You know, losing two in a row now. Mm tight games and part of that part of their struggles so far this season has been Clyde Edwards Alaire and despite you know now he's put the ball on the ground in two consecutive games in the first game uh, against the Ravens he didn't exactly have the chance to come back from it but in week three against uh, the Chargers he definitely did and he did come back in a big way so one of my biggest takeaways so far uh, for week three is that Clyde Edwards Alaire has a ridiculously long leash. And it's really like one of those retractable leashes that are really like 50 feet long. And if you touch the <laughs> rope while it's coming in, your hand gets kind of burnt a little bit. That that's Clyde Edwards Alaire as a real life running back, as a fantasy and as a fantasy running back. After the turnover this week, he did end up with 100 yards, 17 carries, nine yards in the air, and a touchdown in the air on uh, on two catches. So I'm not sure if the fact that he keeps going out there and keeps producing is, you know, about Reed's confidence in CEH or maybe an indictment of Darrell Williams and the ragtag group of past Chiefs running backs that are still on Mm -hmm. the depth chart for some reason. Mm -hmm. Um, But, you know, what I've learned, he's still a top three weapon in this offense. He's going to get the usage like that. And in one of the top offenses in the entire league, um, he's still going to be an RB2 for the rest of the season, in my opinion. If he keeps putting the ball on the ground, I I do worry about that. It's probably going to be a tough road for for Edwards Alaire owners. Um, but it, I, I just want to tell people who own him, like myself, I kind of went to sleep saying, stop worrying about CEH. He's going to give you good weeks. He's going to give you bad weeks. That's just kind of who he is. But he's still a must-start fantasy running back right now. Hmm. Do you, do you feel like he has that upside, though? Like, that's always been my hesitation with him is mm-hmm. he's going to give you RB2, but does he have that ascension within him to be an RB1? Um I, I don't think so, to be completely honest. The yeah. ceiling is there, um, and I don't think he was worth the round two price tag that I and many people paid for him in the drafts this season. Mm-hmm. I was, yeah. If he was in round four, round three, late round three maybe, I think that would justify his value more. Um, but, you know, I can say that that it was not a good second round pick for me and anyone else that took him there this year. Yeah, I, I'm kind of with you there. It, it feels like when we went into this season, right, we wanted Clyde Edwards Hare, guys like McCole Hardman to have that upside to beat because they're in the Chiefs offense. This is an explosive offense. But what yeah. we've seen in the first three weeks is it's just Patrick Mahomes is hyper targeting Travis Kelsey and Tyreek Hill. And it's just kind of falling out. Yes, Clyde Edwards Hilaire is the third best option in that offense, but he doesn't really have upside because it's just Hill and Kelsey. And we even saw last week, too, even though Clyde had his best game of the season, Daryl Williams got more involved in the offense than he had been all year. I believe he had seven carries, and he had three targets as well. So the whole thing with me and the Chiefs' backfield is whoever is the starter, that's the guy I want to own. But I don't think we can have upside that we used to with Chiefs running backs is, oh, this guy could be a top-five fantasy running back. Yeah, It just looks like RB2. Yeah. Yeah, it just looks like RB2 is the ceiling. Yeah, no, it's a shame. You know, it's, it's he was one of my breakout guys for this year. So, you know, I've hit on a few and I've hit on one that I'll, I'll touch on in a little bit. Um, but Steve, what's one of your big takeaways from week three of the NFL season? So I think my biggest takeaway is I'm no longer afraid of the Lions. Coming into the year, you know, DeAndre Swift had a lot, a very high ceiling, but there was a lot of risk to it. And Jamal Williams was the guy who was falling because, you know, he's the backup in the Detroit backfield. They're not going to be a good team. But what we've seen so far this year is that the Lions don't have really any receivers. Yes, TJ Hawkinson's a great tight end. He's their number one option on offense. But I am comfortable for the rest of the year, regardless of matchups, starting both DeAndre Swift and Jamal Williams. They are getting targets in the receiving game. That's the big thing for me. Jared Goff is a check down quarterback, and he's shown it this year. He's 39th among quarterbacks in passing yards per attempt or air yards per pass attempt at 2.0 and 39th in air yards per completion at 2.9. He is just dumping it down to the tight ends and running backs. 
59% of his 86 completions this year have gone to running backs or tight ends. And it makes it so Swift and Williams are both valuable. They're not great in the rushing game so far this year. Swift only 123 rushing yards. Williams only 121. That's like 40 a game. But where they've been elite is the receiving game, especially DeAndre Swift, who's second of all running backs in targets with 23, leads them all in receiving yards, and he's second in receptions with 19. Swift is turning into, dare I say, a poor man's Alvin Kamara, where he doesn't really show too much in the rushing game, but he's getting so many targets. And this is great for the Lions, too, because I thought it'd be maybe game script dependent, right? You know, garbage time getting blown out. But we've th seen three totally different games for the Lions. Week one, they were getting blown out early versus San Francisco. They just targeted DeAndre Swift, and they made that game look closer than it was. We knew it was a blowout. Week two, a tight first half against the Packers, where Swift was involved in the offense. Packers pulled away late in the game. Swift still involved. And then week three, it was a tight defensive struggle versus the Ravens, but it didn't matter. Goff was still just targeting Swift and Williams the entire game. And Jamal Williams, too. I know you love Kareem Hunt, Wake. Yeah. Jamal Williams is kind of right in the Kareem Hunt category for he's, me. Yeah, where very he, similar. He is mm -hmm. one of the top options on this offense, despite being a quote-unquote backup running back. He is still right around 13th in targets, 7th in receptions, and 14th in yards among all running backs. And he's averaging over 15 fantasy points a week. I think, you know, the Lions are a bad team. They're going to be a bad team, but I am completely fine starting either of their running backs week to week basis. And I'm fine trading for these guys too. I really don't think that they're going to fall off. I love what I've seen from the Detroit backfield. I think it's interesting. Yeah. Khalif Raymond was the one who led them in targets yep. yesterday with 10. Like you just can't guess if Baltimore is <laughs> taking out TJ Hawkinson yep. from the outset, you could see mm -hmm. that that was their game plan. And once he's kind of out of the picture, the only guys you can count on are the running backs to get yeah. involved in the passing game. Because otherwise, just throw a dart, whether it's Raymond or it's Darren Fells had three targets yesterday. Or oh, my it's God. Trinity, ben <laughs> Trinity Benson, yeah. some guy that they probably made up in the preseason is getting <laughs> targets. So I think you're right. I think the Lions are one of those rare exceptions where you can have two running backs starting each mm -hmm. week just because mm -hmm. I think in large part, Jared Koff drops back to pass. He doesn't have a lot of other playmakers to get right. the ball to that they kind of have to force feed those running backs. Yeah, he's getting the ball to, to his best players, and, and he's doing it often. Like, as Steve said, DeAndre Swift, he's not only leading running backs in targets, or he's top whatever Steve said, he's leading the Lions in targets with 23 right now. TJ Hawkinson's the only one over 20 with 22. I mean, and DeAndre Swift obviously leading them in, in touches out of the backfield. They're, it, it's, you know, they're a bad team, but they've got a really bad defense, mm -hmm. and you want offensive players attached to really bad defenses, especially when Jared Goff's yeah. going to have to throw, and especially when they're always going to be siphoning those pa those passes down to those short uh, air yards, just because we know Jared Goff, Steve knows from his time in L.A., can't do much else. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Joe, uh, well, you know, we talked about some running backs so far. Are you staying with that position, or you got somewhere else to take us? Yeah, no, let's, let's go running back first. I would be fading Trey Sermon, even after last night he did get in the end zone but i didn't think he looked all that he didn't look like a guy that had a lot of juice to me i didn't wasn't really impressed uh by his burst he only had the 31 yards on 10 carries uh to me it was not all that impressive i think elijah mitchell will have the opportunity to overtake that backfield when he returns to the field and at the best i would say for sermon who clearly kyle shanahan preferred Mitchell over him going into the season. And that's one of those coaches that will mm -hmm. not be beholden to the draft stock. So just no. because Sermon was a third round pick, Mitchell was a sixth round pick, doesn't automatically mean that Sermon's going to be the guy. He's already proven that. And he didn't really take his opportunity and run with it. Like this was his chance, I think, to kind of take over that backfield. And he was okay, but he wasn't, again, overly impressive to me. And don't forget, Mitchell is going to come back. He had a stinger, and it sounds like from what I've read that maybe he's back next week. Maybe it's a split. It's probably a split. It's a timeshare. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a little bit annoying. Maybe Mitchell's leading it. Maybe Sermon's more likely to get a touchdown. Maybe both guys are playable each week, but you don't love it. But eventually, week six, Jeff Wilson is going to come off the pup yeah. list. Oh my and God. if one of these guys, <laughs> I think Mitchell would be the more likely of the two right now, but if one of these guys does not start performing at a higher level, then I think Jeff Wilson's going to come off the bench and maybe he takes over as the lead back in San Francisco. And if that happens, 
Sermon might not even be in a timeshare. Sermon could find himself inactive again like he was at the beginning of the season. So he, I think, has got to step it up. And I would not be starting him next week. I think that touchdown really bailed him out. Um, Again, you could be in a desperate spot and you're looking for, okay, I need a touchdown-dependent guy. He could be that. But other than that, I'm not too optimistic, not too high on Trey Sermon. Maybe you could even find a way to trade him right now, Uh, someone reacting to, to the point total from yesterday. Yeah, if, if Trey Lance was, you know, if he stayed in the game last night, I think we could have seen a little bit more from Trey Sermon. I think that entire offense would just honestly be better. Um, but, you know, if you look at what he did last night, you're right, extremely underwhelming. Less than three yards a touch. I'm not going to look at per yeah. carry. I mean, it's just three yards a touch. He only had three, yep. ca- three yards on two catches. Like, you know, we kind of expected more from him in that regard. Um, I... Yeah, after this week, it's going to be just, you know, the usual musical chairs of running backs for the 49ers. And unfortunately, I'm going to have way bigger of a part of it than I'd be comfortable with. Because <laughs> I have Sermon in so many leagues. I picked up Mitchell in a few because I had Raheem Mostert go out in a few. You know, Steve knows that in our train wreck league. That, that was not mm. great. Um, but, I yeah, if you, if you were high on the 49ers running backs, like you justifiably should have been, you've kind of found yourself in a tough spot. The- Think of it this way. He had 10 carries last night. Remember, the backfield to himself. No Elijah Mitchell, yep. no Jamichael Hasty, no Mostert, mm-hmm. no Jeff Wilson. Everybody around him is injured, and he got 10 of 21 carries on the night. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Seven uh, guys got carries in total. Kyle Juszczyk got, got five carries. <laughs> right. Like, even with everything cleared out around him, yeah. he still only got half the carries. Like, mm-hmm. To me, that's that's a troublesome sign. Yeah, I mean, Kyle Juszczyk outscored him last night in fantasy points, which is crazy. And you brought up a great point, Joe. I think Jeff Wilson is a guy that Kyle Shanahan loves. He pounds the table for. And when he's activated, he's going to have a role regardless. Jeff Wilson is someone you should be stashing in your leagues because when he comes back, I think he's going to play. And if they really, truly do believe that, you know, they want to face Trey Sermon out of the offense, I would not be shocked in the slightest to see Jeff Wilson come in and Trey Sermon just becomes an afterthought. Yeah, last year, Jeff Wilson and Chase Edmonds uh, were my basically, you know, my back and forth RB2s in the championship league I won last year. So, you know, I have a soft spot for Jeff Wilson. So I'm looking forward to see him coming back. Um, One guy I was high on in the offseason that I want to bring up, and when we had Mark Schofield, uh, who covers the Pats for Pats Pulpit and covers quarterbacks for USA Today uh, on the Crowd Assist podcast, we asked him, is there one player from the Patriots offense who people should have their eyes on for fantasy? And he said, yes, and it's not a running back, as I'm sure you understand. He said it was Jacoby Myers. And I still, after three weeks, even though he is right now the wide receiver 38 in fantasy, I still think that he is the guy to own in that offense over Damian Harris, over James White. Obviously, James White got carted off yesterday, so let's hope that he's able to make a quick recovery. Um, But he's just really good at the receiver position. And yesterday against the New Orleans Saints, a tough matchup. He put up nine catches, 94 yards, and they weren't all in garbage time. They were spread out throughout the game. I have him in my one guillotine league. I was actually keeping an eye on him. Box score watching, but still, you know, he's Mac Jones, clear number one target in the offense. And Belichick is catering the offense to a young quarterback by just making sure he knows to get it to the guys who are open and open quickly. And every single play, that's Jacoby Myers. because He's got 14 targets yesterday. He's leading the team with 29 on the year. That's almost 10 a game. And yes, 14 yesterday, that leaves 15 through the first two weeks, but still seven and eight targets in, in weeks one and two, respectively. That's still not bad whatsoever. He's averaging 12.2 points per game in PPR, and he's only owned in 60% of leagues right now, which is a bit ridiculous. He's only catching 60% of his passes, too. And I think that is kind of chalked up to, uh, you know, Mac Jones being a rookie, them not being completely on the same page. A lot of those targets have been, you know, a little off. Mac Jones isn't the mm-hmm. most accurate quarterback in the world. So I think as the season goes on, Myers' production is only going to get better. Mac Jones is mm-hmm. going to lose those rookie jitters. I don't think he's a good quarterback, but, I mean – you know, that's not the point here. The point is Jacoby Myers is good enough to produce even with a bad quarterback. I think he's at least a good wide receiver three for the rest of the season, in my opinion. 
Yeah, I, I'm right there with you, Wick. And one of the big things you touched on, he's wide receiver 38 right now, but he hasn't scored a touchdown. He yeah. hasn't scored a touchdown yet. Yeah, yeah he <laughs> has yet to be in the end zone. And your wide receiver 38, you want to be you know, a solid wide receiver option. You probably want to break into the top 30. He's right there. At the 14 targets is a very encouraging sign. And he's passed the eye test, too. He has looked good from the eye test. I like Jacoby Myers and the Patriots. There's really no one else I trust. Yes, Damian Harris, but he's not going to get involved in the receiving game at all. And the Patriots, Nelson Aguilar is Nelson Aguilar. He hasn't really shown <laughs> yeah. me anything. Jacoby Myers should be the number one option going forward, and he should be the guy that they target when they get into the red zone. I'm looking now just to make sure this is right, because I think it's got to be. He has 104 receptions for his career and zero receiving touchdowns. Wouldn't you imagine he's got to be, if he's not the first, he's got to be one of few <laughs> players to get yeah. to 100 receptions before scoring wow. a touchdown. Um, oh, my God. I think he might have the NFL record for that. Either way, though, uh, whether or not that that's out. true. Oh, yeah, God. whether <laughs> I'm trying to find it on stat right now. But whether or not yeah, that's, that's true, not I, would do. <laughs> I think you make a good point that he's an integral part of the offense. In fact, my biggest reason for kind of not being sold on him coming into the year, really not even owning him anywhere, was they added Jonu Smith and Hunter Henry. Yeah. And mm -hmm. Jacoby Myers is a slot wide receiver that wins over the middle of the field. So that was a crowded area of the field with the two tight ends coming in. But clearly, so far through a couple of games, he's really only got Hunter Henry to compete with. And he's definitely above Henry in the pecking order because New England's getting very creative with how they're using Jonu Smith. He's lined up wide a lot more often than I think we thought. They're using him in the backfield sometimes, giving him carries out there, jet sweeps. So to me, like the middle of the field has been unclogged a little bit, and he has the trust of Mac Jones right now, I would say, over Hunter Henry. Yeah. And Henry's also staying in the block a lot. So there's also times where he is the only guy kind of running those uh, those those crossing routes. So I think he's a productive player, only PPR, yes. only PPR for yes. him. He's the extreme example of this because mm -hmm. the reception totals, the target totals are so high. But again, zero touchdowns. If you don't score touchdowns, you're not going to be a wide receiver one. And in standard, you're not going to be a wide receiver two. For BPR, I think, though, he's proving that even without the scores, he could be wide receiver, too. But until yeah. he finds the end zone, I think, you know, but again, what does that to say? He can't be a top 10 <laughs> wide receiver. Nobody thought he was that coming into the year anyway. Right. Yeah. No. Bare minimum, he's a flex play the rest of the year in PPR. Um, so so I'm excited to have as much as many shares of him as I do. Uh, Steve, you, what's your second takeaway from week three? So I'm going with another running back, and it's another offense that had a lot of question marks going into the season. It's the Pittsburgh Steelers and what Najee Harris has shown me, which I didn't really expect going into the season. I knew he you know, was involved in the receiving game at Alabama. He was a good receiving back, but he is turning into one of the best PPR backs in all of fantasy, and part of it is because of what everyone talked about in the offseason, the Steelers' bad offensive line, and Big Ben's just not the same quarterback he was anymore. And we've seen that through three weeks. Ben Roethlisberger has been horrible this year. He's 32nd in air yards per completion at 4.6, and he's 34th in air yards per attempt or pass attempt at 2.9. But he's just not throwing the ball downfield despite all the weapons he has at his arsenal. And we saw it last week. Yes, there was no Deontay Johnson, and Juju left the game with a rib injury. But you look at what Najee Harris did. He had 19 targets last week. That is unheard of for a running back. He now leads all running backs on the year in targets with 27, receptions with 20, and he's fourth in yards with 149. And Najee Harris hasn't even ran the ball well, only 40 carries for 123 yards, and he's only scored one touchdown. Despite the Steelers' bad offensive line and despite Ben Roethlisberger you know, playing very bad, Najee Harris is showing – very good fantasy value, you know, more so than what you paid for him. He's the number six running back right now in all of fantasy and in PPR leagues. And I think it's only going to get better as the year goes on because Ben Roethlisberger is refusing to throw down the field. Late in the game yesterday when the Steelers played the Bengals, it was 24-10. It was a fourth down in 10. The Steelers were in the red zone. They had to score. There was, I think, less than three minutes left, down two mm -hmm. scores. 
and Ben Roethlisberger threw a wheel route to Najee about two seconds into the snap where there was no one blocking and four guys running at him. Of course he didn't get the first down there, but it just shows that Ben is just refusing to throw the ball down the field. And Najee Harris is someone who's very good after the catch, too. He made a lot out of nothing last week. Despite, you know, getting 14 receptions, a lot of it was behind the line of scrimmage, and Najee had to put in all the work to even get them some type of yards. I don't, I'm not worried about a bad offensive line, and I'm really not worried about Ben Roethlisberger anymore because I think Najee Harris is just going to get that value in the receiving game now. He may not be as an effective runner as we expected, mm. but as a receiver, he's turning into one of the very rare elite receiving backs. Yeah, I think, you know, uh, go ahead, sorry. No, I was just going to say, like, you know, we've seen running backs produce in that same exact fashion in the Pittsburgh offense before. Like, yep. even James Conner did. Le'Veon Bell was known for making something out of nothing with Ben Roethlisberger while he was aging. Um, and even before he got to this point. Right now, he he's probably going to lead that team in catches by the end of the year. I, if, if there's odds to put money on that, I would... I would put money on Najee Harris leading that team in catches, leading that team and maybe even receiving yards. Like he's, he's just as much of a problem in the NFL as everybody thought he was going to be. Maybe not in the exact way, but mm -hmm. I mean, just for fantasy purposes, if you drafted him, you got first round value in the second round, it looks like. And that's an amazing yeah. thing to happen. Joe. He right now has played all but seven snaps. This yeah. Year. Like he is, <laughs> he is tracking towards the type of workload and the type of snap count even that yeah. we have not seen since like the nineties. And I would say because of Ben Roethlisberger and like, I look around at other old quarterbacks as they've aged really as their mobility goes away and their plan B can't be to scramble out of the pocket. Well, they become the check down Kings, Drew Brees, yeah. to Elvin Kamara, Philip Rivers to Austin Eckler, and then to Naheem Hines. Brady did this with James White, and now it's do it happening. Look at Giovanni Bernard yesterday. Didn't he have like six catches yeah. or something? Yep. <laughs> the Steelers, like that's Najee Harris because he's the only guy who plays. And actually, he was a good pass catching back coming into the league. Mm -hmm. I think yeah. he, that his reputation for that kind of got hurt with all the Derrick Henry comparisons because everywhere else, you know, you can compare him to Derrick Henry. But Derrick Henry's not a pass catcher until right. magically yesterday, apparently. Um, <laughs> but Harris was always a good receiving back at Alabama. He's making one-handed grabs back shoulder. Like, this guy's a good pass catching running back. And again, mm -hmm. he's the only guy who plays. Benny Snell's played seven snaps. And Harris is just under 200 for the season. So it's his show. And 19 targets yesterday. Like it's that's a high bar to reach. He's probably not going to reach that again. For the rest <laughs> it's JD of the McKissick season. level, <laughs> right? Exactly. But like, I think among running backs in the league, I might not only predict he might lead the Steelers in targets, but he might lead all running backs in wow. targets this season. Given wow. Ben Roethlisberger is just completely immobile, yep. and you mentioned it, he doesn't want to push a ball down the field, so yet leaves him two options: crossing patterns to Juju Smith-Schuster and Deontay Johnson, yep. or checking it down to Najee Harris. Yeah, no. Love that we're all in the, There's been very little arguing so far. So maybe we, as we get through our last four takeaways here, we'll get through. We'll have some of that. Joe, what's your second from week three? I think people should be buying low on Allen Robinson. Uh, it was yeah. a bad, bad performance. I know mm -hmm. yesterday against the Cleveland Browns, but tough first game for Justin Fields on the road in Cleveland. That's a tough defense. That's a tough environment. First NFL start. I think the volume is still there for Robinson. 21 targets through three games. And we still know he's their best red zone threat. He has performed well. He's performed great even with bad quarterback play in the past. He's only had bad quarterbacks yeah, throughout right. his NFL career. I believe he could do it again, and I would not be overreacting to the first three weeks of Allen Robinson. And there is still, to me, that potential that Justin Fields, if he even stays in, is going to get – He's going to get to a place that Robinson has not had under center yet in his career where he can be pushing the ball down the field. He does look like that dynamic passer under center that, that Robinson has not had. Again, not a good start for that, but maybe that's an opportunity for you to buy low, not only on Robinson, but on Justin Fields and the Bears offense mm -hmm. as a whole. Because I love that guy coming into the draft. He, I thought he was the second best quarterback in the draft. I thought it was crazy he went as late as he did. Mm -hmm. And again, the people that might have thought he was right to go in the teens in the first round yesterday were like, see, this is why. But, again, I think it's going to come back. I, he's not going to maybe be lighting the world on fire the way Deshaun Watson did in his rookie year. But I think the Bears passing offense will improve, even whether Fields stays in there or Dalton comes back. 
And I think Robinson, he, he's a he's trustworthy enough. The sample size is there where I would still be keeping him in my lineup. I wouldn't be overreacting. And even I would be trying to buy low on him uh, if I was someone looking for a trade. Yeah, yeah, I didn't uh, watch the game much yesterday, but just based on the box score, and, and I hate, and I do want to go back and watch this game sometime this week. Fields only got three carries, and he threw the yeah. ball twenty times. He got sacked nine times. I feel yeah. like they were trying to basically run the Andy Dalton version of the Bears' offense um, with yeah. Justin Fields, and, and you know, I'll, I'll watch actually watch the game so I can know if I'm right there. But you know, if, if Andy Dalton's injury persists like this. They can't continue to do the same play. Even even if it doesn't, they should have had a second game plan for Justin Fields being out there. Um, you know, I hate Matt Nagy, but I mean, talent in fantasy and even on the football field can uh, outweigh bad coaching. <laughs> and right. and I'm hoping that Justin Fields, you know, coming out of the draft, I thought he had the talent to be able to do it. Um, I, I would buy low, but very, very cautiously. Uh, but Allen Robinson, 110%. I mean, like Blake Bortles, Mike Glennon, Jay Cutler, like he's had so many bad quarterbacks. Throw they, him, so. team, yeah. team passing yards, by the way, yesterday for the Bears, one. <laughs> not because, only. <laughs> like not for fields, because if you include the, like the, yeah. the team passing yards, include the sacks, the exactly. sack losses, uh, they oh ended up God. with one. They only ran 42 plays. Like that game from I only saw really what I saw in red zone and then exactly. the, like, the YouTube highlight packages they do after. Mm -hmm. But Cleveland – out like they lapped them in in uh in time of possession 39 to 20 and again wow. only 42 plays for chicago so they really i it, don't get me wrong fields was not good in any way but they just didn't have the ball a lot and yeah. cleveland is kind of built to beat you that way and there will be games down the road i think they've got detroit coming up next um oh, there yeah. will be games okay. down the road where like that's not going to happen you're gonna have twice as many plays you might have twice as many pass attempts and robinson by target percentage uh was still he was king there in chicago so um yeah just it was just a weird game i think for the bears in, in general it, it can't get worse right they average 1.1 <laughs> 1. 1 yards worse. per play that's the second fewest of any team in a game this century it's not <laughs> going to get worse and there's no way you're basically betting on fields and dalton being better than bortles and trubisky because robinson was a wide receiver one and two with those quarterbacks in his career I don't think Fields and Dalton are that much worse than those two guys. Robinson's going to have to regress towards the mean. He's going to be a good wideout, and now's the time to buy because he's been terrible so far this year. Yeah. Uh, my next one, uh, I'm not going to go with a specific player, but a specific position group that you should be playing against a specific team. So if you are a guy who waited on tight end, this is for you. If you love DFS, this is absolutely for you. Play any tight end that you can against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. In three games, the Bucs have given up 20 catches, 193 yards, and a touchdown to the tight end position. And it's not like they've faced amazing tight ends. There have been some good ones, don't get me wrong. But between Kyle Pitts, you know, but rookie tight ends take a while to come into the NFL. Lee Smith had a touchdown against the Bucs. <laughs> Hayden Hurst, uh, Blake Jarwin, and Dalton Schultz back when all the wide receivers were healthy, mind you. And now Tyler Higby went for 540 yep. and then a touchdown yesterday. Uh, you know, in fantasy football, there are always matchups like this that kind of represent themselves to you every single week. And last year for me, it was slot receivers against the Bears, tight ends against the Bills, sorry, running backs against the Lions, and any pass catcher you can get against Seattle. The first one I've really been able to lock in this year is tight ends against the Bucs. It's one that's been consistent. You've been getting value on. So if you're streaming the position, definitely put in like $1 bids on your on your waiver wire for any tight end you see going against the Bucs. Yeah, that's I mean, <laughs> tight end Tight ends is a wasteland lit this year. Decision. The number one tight end this week is Tyler Conklin at 20 <laughs> points, and he was available in probably all your league. Penguins goalie, right? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, it, it, tight ends is a position you can get away with streaming if you don't have, you know, one of the five studs with, you know, Kelsey, Kittle, yep. Hawkinson, Andrews. Just stream them, and the Buccaneers is a perfect time to stream because a lot of people think, oh, the Bucks, great team, great defense. I don't want to play anyone against them. That's your opportunity to go and get a tight end who faces them. I don't hate that take at all, Wake, and I was very happy for this week because I had a Tyler Higbee first touchdown at plus 1,300, and he wow. got it for me. So thank you, Tampa Bay, for not covering the tight ends. <laughs> 
It's interesting. Like that's not a position I often hear like play the matchups. Like you hear that mm -hmm. with quarterback streaming and you hear that with defense streaming a lot. Um, but it's not often one I've thought of for that, but it makes sense, especially at a position that, like you said, outside of Kelsey, Waller, Hawkinson, and maybe Andrews, like everybody mm -hmm. else is pretty much touchdown dependent. Maybe yeah. Logan Thomas I'd want to throw in there too. There are other guys that are kind mm -hmm. of in between, but like Pat Fryermuth is a tight end one so far this year. Like why? Like <laughs> yeah. you got to chase the touchdowns. And if they're coming at a higher mm -hmm. rate against Tampa – than other teams, then I, I, I'm interested in the strategy. I might try to play this out in a league or two this week, actually. There we go. You know what? That's what the show is all about, is helping each other and helping the listeners. Steve, how are you going to help us out right now? So I'm going to say something, and you can call me bias if you want, but oh, I think thing, Cooper right? – uh, yeah, I think yeah, Cooper Cup is the second best receiver in football going forward. I really do. I know it's been a hot start, and I don't want to overreact to three weeks. But there was it was very weird this year, right? He was drafted as the 18th wide receiver in PPR leagues. He was going a, a round or two after Robert Woods. Everyone just assumed Robert Woods would be the favorite target for Matt Stafford, and that hasn't been the case so far this year. Cooper Cup right now is second in the NFL in targets with 33. He leads the NFL in receptions with 25, and he leads them in yards with 367. He also has five receiving touchdowns. And, yes, we will see some touchdown regression, but what I've seen in three weeks is he is Matt Stafford's guy. It is He is clear number one option for this Rams offense, and it's going to be a good offense because McVay has his new toy now, Stafford, and they're moving the ball down the field. Cooper Cup is getting big plays. He's not getting the little checkdowns he got with Jared Goff anymore. He's running a lot of deep post routes. He's running a lot of just streaks, and he's getting wide open. He's doing what he's been doing his entire career, and that's just getting wide open, and Stafford's getting the ball to him. Cooper Cup, he's faced three decent defenses. Say what you will about the Bears, Colts, and Buccaneers, but they aren't the worst defenses in the NFL. The Colts have a solid secondary. The Bucs, yes, that's probably the weakest point of their defense, but they're still an overall good defense. And the Bears' defense has been a middle-of-the-road defense the past couple seasons. His next six games, he plays the Cardinals, whose secondary has not been good this year. The Seahawks, whose defense oh has been God. very bad. The Giants, the Lions, the Texans, and the Titans. I think he can sustain the start he's had, maybe not to the point of 30 fantasy points a week because you will see touchdown aggression, but I'm talking about the double-digit targets every week, the catches, you know, plus six, seven catches every single week and near 100 yards, and right now in fantasy – there's really no one else I would rather have at the receiver position than De Cooper Cup besides Devontae Adams. If it's not Devontae Adams, I would be okay doing a one-for-one -one deal with any of the stud receivers, and I'm including Hopkins. I'm including Diggs. I'm including yeah. Metcalf in those situations because, you know, there are a lot of other bodies in those receiving groups. And for the Rams, it's been Cooper Cup is the clear one. Yes, Robert Woods will get more involved, but he's definitely the number two. And the Rams also don't have the best running game in the world, and their running backs aren't the best pass-catching running backs. Stafford's going to air it out, and I think Cooper Cup is a legitimate number one wide receiver, and I think he's the second-best wide receiver in fantasy now. It's hard for me to disagree. I mean, I, I thought Stafford coming in there was going to see an uptick for the entire offense. There's a big upgrade to me from Jared Goff. And someone was going to see the benefit of that. And really, everybody mm -hmm. is seeing the benefit of it a little bit, but Cup especially. So through three games, I mean, he's had stretches like this in his career before yes. that would tell you that this is not a fluke. This is not a mirage in any way. It's not even maybe inflated. Just because of, you know, maybe he's on the same page. Maybe he was the first one to build chemistry with Stafford. Like, Cup has had, has had stretches like this uh, in his career before. So, to me, it's not a surprise in any way. Um, and I think, I mean, you got to keep rolling with him. I know Mike Williams right now is paced. Oh, no, is Mike Williams even above him? I think the numbers I'm looking at are, like, I don't think updated. targets. I think he's close hold on fantasy, i have him i have cup okay so fantasy pros you know what might be happening they're actually updating this as i'm reading it uh <laughs> because like like williams is in at three games and like dj moore is in at three games but cup is still sitting at two but mm -hmm. i can still make the point even without the third game going into the game well let's do this way williams with yesterday's game yes. counted is wide receiver one he's 277 in ppr Okay, PPR. In Cup, I've got 
as number three at only two games played. So okay. again, I think Cup is going to end up being wide receiver. Yeah, one. he's wide receiver, he wide receiver one right one. now, and okay. Mike Williams is two. That's 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 crazy to me yeah. um, that he's maybe had this type of ascension. But I would count on it continuing. If it's if he's not going to be one or two, he's not going to be very far behind that. I think his floor is insanely is insanely high. So uh, it's it's harder to find another receiver in the league right now to count on than him. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's all I got for him. I I, I think I would all take. Right. Him over every wide receiver besides Devontae Adams. I'll go with uh, my number three takeaway here, and I'm going to the Raiders. I'm going to Henry Ruggs for this one. Um, what do I want here for Ruggs, though? Because you probably weren't starting him before this week, but you probably had picked him up. Like, there's probably very few leagues where he was available, especially, I mean, deeper leagues and dynasty leagues, obviously he's owned. Uh, but like a standard redraft league, he might have still been out there, and maybe he's going to be a big waiver wire guy. He's up to 19 targets through three games. And it's not a crazy high number, but it's good. It's good. It's sustainable enough to warrant starting him week to week, in my opinion, given the big playability that we all know is there with Henry Ruggs. Big plays down the field. They're getting creative getting him the ball also. It's not just he's running straight up the field and they're using him like only on a couple of routes and they know that he's got the speed, but... They're also incorporating like these quick outs, these screens. They're they're having him run jet motion behind Derek Carr, and they're flipping him the ball and handoffs or or or, uh, or tosses. And to me, the creativity that's there, combined with his ability to get open down the field, I think nineteen targets through three games. I could I could have him at six seven targets a game, and still have him be a reliable. Uh, starting fantasy wide receiver, wide receiver two, somewhere between wide receiver two and flex worthy. Um, just because there are going to be games where he's going to win you the week. He's going to score an 80 yard touchdown mm -hmm. and he's just going to win you the week. Like he has that type of game breaking ability. And now that the floor is high enough to where he's not really going to have those. It looks like to me, he's a big enough part of that offense and he looks great. I mean, he's making contested catches. Derek Carr's just flipping it up in the air, and he's out jumping Xavier and Howard. Like, yesterday's game, I was really impressed. He looked like a complete wide receiver to me, Henry Ruggs did. Um, so, to me, all of that together, the equation adds up to the floor is now high enough to have Ruggs in your lineup week to mm -hmm. week, and you can you can actually take advantage of some of those games that he'll, he'll go off for 30 points. It, yeah, it's a very encouraging sign to see Ruggs finally getting used in the offense like they drafted him to be a wide receiver one. You know, 14 targets in the last two weeks, over 180 yards. I like what I've seen from Ruggs, and Derek Carr's playing very well so far this year, and Ruggs is the big play threat. Brian Edwards and Hunter Renfro are great, but they're more possession-type guys. Edwards will get a couple deep balls here, but you're right, Joe. If there is one guy in this Raiders offense to get that 80-yard bomb that really kind of breaks the slate each week it is Henry Ruggs and it's been very encouraging what we've seen from him in the first three weeks after a very disappointing rookie season sorry about lagging out there guys but you sounded smart as hell when I got back in here I'll say that <laughs> much um you know I think I feel like it was clear that when the Raiders drafted him like John Gruden was like let's make him a vertical threat this is Deshaun Jackson let's just make him right. run straight and stretch the offense when they learned that he's actually good at football and he's more than just a decoy um, he, he's definitely, I mean, as I'm sure you guys said, you know, the four catches for 78 yards against a good Miami secondary, um, yeah. you know, and set the seven targets to go along with it this past week. Uh, I was a rug. I was questioning him, honestly, coming into this year. I was higher on Brian Edwards. I was higher on John Brown, even who's no longer on the team. Um, right. but you know, rugs is definitely, uh, you know, he's, he's a wide receiver three at minimum for the rest of the season. Um, but Joe, I know you got to get out of here. So, you know, excuse the Long Island Wi-Fi. you know, I can't, I'd love to say it won't <laughs> no, happen you're good. again, but you know, it may happen again. But by the way, uh, before I, before I go, I did find it. I found oh, the good. list of wide, I, the list of players with a hundred plus receptions mm -hmm. for their career mm -hmm. and zero touchdowns. Myers is one of seven guys. So he's wow. now at 104 receptions. <laughs> uh, Frank Pollard. These are going to be a lot of players from way before we were born. Yeah, Frank Pollard sure. in the eighties. <laughs> Earl Campbell, though, is one oh, that we would know. 121 okay. receptions. Leonard Russell, Doug Cunningham, Eric Bieniemy had 146 wow. receptions and no touchdowns. And then Gerald Riggs in the 80s and 90s with 201. Wow. So, for the record, 
what's what's that? Uh, Myers needs 97 more receptions to have the most catches before his t- first <laughs> touchdown. Uh, so he's got a he's got a ways to go for the record. I'll but say if you're a Myers, Jones, so it yeah. happen. And <laughs> yes, if you're a Myers right. owner, you don't want him to get that record. <laughs> no, you don't. Unless he does it this year, because if he had 97 more receptions this yeah. year, you might be okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh my, especially through 14 weeks. Oh, that'd be one great season for a Patriots yeah. receiver. And honestly, that'll that's the kind of stat that we'll be hearing on the radio. I know sometime soon. Oh, so yeah. maybe <laughs> maybe tune into to Joe with uh, show up in the Bulldog later today, and you know I'm sure you'll be hearing them talk about that. And tune into us later this week. We'll be back Thursday with Week Four game by game analysis. Those shows have been going almost two hours long now. So man, it's it, it's a it's a workout. It's a workout. So I might have to start going to the gym. But they're fun. Until, a lot of questions. They're always oh, yeah. fun. Oh, yeah. The YouTube questions are hilarious on that one. We, <laughs> Joe, for the last thing I'll tell you, we told someone to start uh, Gronk and Noah Fant last week uh, and go double tight end. Uh, and we're pretty, uh, he hasn't messaged us, but we're pretty sure it worked out. Uh, I hope so, he didn't do that again this week because Fant was pretty damn bad in that game against the Jets. But yeah, that's, I, re- <laughs> I really hope not. Yeah, you're right. Everybody was bad in that game. But yeah. make sure you guys tune in because we were keyed in on that game as a game that would disappoint probably. So you want to be with us on Thursday night around 5 o'clock. I think we'll be going live. But stay tuned for a show announcement for that. But until then, for Steve, Joe, Outlet Liquor, Picasso's, and everyone at Trainwreck Sports, thanks for tuning in. Thank you.